For families that haven't read Spark, which again, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. If you or someone in your life, you know, has ADHD or executive function challenges, what is the core research that we learned from Spark? Well, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. I think the most poignant thing is that exercise really is, is all about the brain. Big brains evolved because we were movers and it helped us be better movers. And so this led them to executive functions in moving, the planning, adapting, changing, remembering, all those kinds of human attributes. Part of the executive tree came to help us be the best movers to be the evolutionary victors. And with that, we, our brains grew big and, and human. And so what I love to quote is something from a renowned neuroscientist who said, learning or intellectual cognition is internalized movement. In other words, we have our ability to think from our ability to move and be better movers. So what we have is the situation that when we move, when we're active, we are using about 80% of the brain stuff that we got of the 100 billion nerve cells. Many of them are the same nerve cells that we need to think, to plan with, to understand, to take in information. All that is jazzed up with movement. And what you said at the very beginning about how movement is as much for the brain, if not more for the brain than it is for the body. That's such a huge mind shift for most people. It is. It's important to put that in perspective so that people can remember when they want to lag in their movement, lag in their exercise, lag in their play. It's not just an add-on in schools or in life. It should be a focus for everybody to use movement to help with their thinking, with their memory. Because it seems so common knowledge now in 2025 that movement is good for your brain. But before your work in Spark came out, I'd never heard of this before. What inspired you to do this research? Well, my life, I think. <laughs> my ADD had me moving all the time. And I played four sports, got a tennis scholarship, and just was always outside moving. So I realized how important it was for me. And then began to go getting into psychiatry in medical school and seeing patients and learning about how movement affected their lives. I mean, I had this one patient who was, it changed my life and led to our work in ADHD. He was a professor and I had his books on my shelf and I was talking about ADHD, ADD back in those days in adults. And he said, can I come see you? And I said, yeah, sure. And he said, look, I was a marathoner all my life and I hurt my knee and I, I'm rehabbing now. And boy, do I have all the symptoms of attention deficit disorder. Well, at that period of time in the early 80s, there was no papers written about ADHD in adults. And, and so I treated him. He, he got better. And then he started rehabbing and he started running again and eventually didn't need medicine anymore, you know, and, and went on to be an amazingly productive self. He was both a professor at Harvard and at MIT. And so super productive, but had hit the wall when he stopped training because of his knee. And as that improved, he got back to his being able to think and process and do all the stuff that he always did. So this led to two careers, one in ADHD and another in the value of exercise. So I began a, a full court sprint on looking at all the papers coming out on exercise and its effect on the brain. There were few, but they were coming, you know, especially in psychiatry. We had known since Hippocrates that exercise was good for mood, right? Mood disorders. Well, we were beginning to get this objectified. We were beginning to get evidence, especially out of Duke University Medical School in the 80s and 90s, looking at exercise as a treatment for depression. And oh my God, it was such a big deal because... <laughs> We were getting a new antidepressant every week or every month. And so there are a lot of papers on depression coming out. And, and here was exercise, not medicine, but very much medicine. And now you're, what was it, last decade, it was exercise is medicine, you know, and, and it is medicine for the body and for all the ails of civilization, but it's really medication for the brain. Boy, does it ever work. And, and you know, we're all into anti-aging. The number one thing on everybody's panel for things to do to prevent aging, and especially the brain aging, is exercise. Number one, for the brain, 
not yeah. you know, obviously for the body to lower your sugar to lower your fat content to improve your heart and lungs and all that but it's the brain that really gets the biggest impact and one of the things i admired so much about it too is first of all we all knew it intuitively like you said you're like i can't do anything if i don't move but no one had put those pieces together and done the work but then the other thing is what's best practice for everybody is just essential if you have adhd or these executive function challenges and i think that's what i love so much is that it's just best practice for everybody but it's essential if you struggle with one of these things oh yeah no it really well like my index patient my very first patient I mean, he had all these symptoms that came up out of nowhere, it seemed, because he'd never had them before, but this only had them because he stopped running. You know, he stopped doing his seven miles a day because of his knee. He couldn't do it. And so he had procrastination. He had anger attacks. He had not being able to get started and forgetting things, which he never did before. So his steady diet of exercise really helped him with all his cognitive functions, as well as his emotions, because he got depressed too. And, yeah. and which is very typical when you see these athletes, super athletes, all of a sudden stop training. They either go to addictions or depression or anger. They, they get into trouble because they're not having that steady diet of exercise. And I know we work with a lot of student athletes as well. It's almost like there's a higher percentage potentially with ADHD because we're self-medicating. And if you self-medicate enough, you just get really good at your sport. Is that something you've seen as well? Well, that's what my, again, my first patient was self-medicating. That's what we called it. I mean, he never knew he had these troubles because he was from early age, he was out there running and then became one of the first marathoners, you know, in the Boston group. So it prevented him from knowing that he had problems with his attention and focus. And I have many people like that throughout my life now seeing people. And just so many people have this as, oh yeah, when I played sports, I did better. You know, parents, when Johnny was doing Taekwondo, he was better behaved because with that, he did a lot of aerobic exercise and a lot of training to do whatever sport he was involved in. And this led to better behavior, better scores in school, easier time of it in life. One of the big things that I think has really come into the fore or two, one, how important balance and coordination are with this, with the whole thing, because that's that really makes the brain more balanced and more coordinated as well. You know, and, and all of our higher brain functions get positive there. But a big thing that we're seeing so much interest in is the effect on socialization, that exercise has a very big effect on making us more social. And even down to oxytocin, which is the bonding love hormone. We get a boost there. My book came out right as we were cracking that puzzle. But, uh, you know, now there's even more evidence that this is a great way to improve socialization and to improve bonding and all that that brings. Yeah, it's kind of like the miracle drug right now, right? It's like sleep and exercise. If you can lock those in with ADHD, you at least have a fighting chance. One of the questions I get most after people who read your book is about like a workout protocol. Like they're always like, okay, can I move sporadically throughout the day? Is that good enough? Or should I have like structured movements or, you know, should I be doing Taekwondo or yoga? And so I get a lot of questions about that. How do you answer that question? I say, do what you will do again and again and again. Do it with that which draws you. Now, the the best exercise is something that you'll come back to, but where you're getting your heart rate up, you're moving enough to challenge your heart rate with somebody outside. And if, if it involves thinking and changing, like Taekwondo, like dance or yoga or soccer or basketball, or the big one is tennis, you know, or pickleball for us aging, because you, you have to change all the time. And that demands a tremendous amount of brain work. And the take home here is the brain is like a muscle. The more you use it, the better it gets. You don't wear it out. You make it better. And with that, exercise improves our brain function. Well, thank you for explaining that. I always say don't overthink it. And your answer was much better than mine. I love the planning piece and and the changing in the outside piece. I think that's such a great insight. A little bit ago, you said kind of the miracle word in our world right now, and that's procrastination. How does exercise help with procrastination? Because that's such a big issue right now. Well, one, it helps with the sense of calmness and a a decrease in what I call noise in the body and in the brain so that this allows people to not be driven to some kind of addiction like their phone. You know, I mean, procrastination today 
means your phone's in your hand and you're scrolling or you're playing a video game or you're seeing what's on YouTube or TikTok or whatever you do. And it helps you avoid being real, being in the moment, being connected to what your passion might be. So procrastination is like avoiding ent entering the fray. And part of that is driven by momentary anxiety. And, and so you really want to quell that inner disease, disease, you know, you're not at ease. And when you're at ease, you're going to be much more liable and able to participate in things that you want to participate in. And, and what, take me back to Spark, because I know it's changed over time, but in Spark, I believe it was 15 minutes at getting your heart rate above 75% resting rate. Is that still what you go by or has that changed? Well, I think you can do three minutes. You know, I mean, if you do three minutes of jump rope, your brain's going to be changed for the moment and maybe for the next 15 minutes. So people who have a hard time getting started studying, doing something like that, doing some yoga poses or running up a hill or jumping down and doing 20 push-ups, you will have a different brain and a brain ready to tackle whatever it is. I, in my book, I talk about the jump rope lady and her, her daughter who was a bright little kid, but hated math and would throw a tantrum every time she tried to do math homework because she couldn't, you know, she'd get too frustrated and she had ADD kind of thing, but never diagnosed. And I said, well, just introduce her to jump rope and have her jump rope before she sits down to do her homework. And sure enough, it helped her become proficient in math. She's now a, a graduate nurse and on the way, I've been on the regional jump rope team. It's got to be so cool for you to see the impact that that this research has. I mean, for myself, it's just a game changer. So to have that, I mean, at scale, it's got to be very rewarding. Oh, it's it's hugely rewarding. You know, and I, I see patients and see this help change their lives and their outcome. It is so rewarding. So, yeah. and it's so simple. It's so simple. It's like, you know, what do you do? Well, you go outside and take one step, then take another, and then another, and then another, and then you're on your way. Whether it's to the pickleball courts or to basketball courts or whatever, or just out there walking and being. Yeah, it's, it's free medicine, right? It's free and it's so healthy. Dealing with kids, you have to get them hooked on a game a lot of the times, on some kind of something where they're challenged to get better, which is great which is fantastic, you know, because then they have goals, then they will try to work hard to get there. Well, I mean, I guess that brings me to my second to last question for you is, what have you seen schools do or teachers do that's been really successful here? Because I get that question a lot. It's like, teachers are always asking, how, how can they incorporate movement in their classroom? Like, what are some things that you've seen? Well, for the younger kids, getting the kids to run around outside before the school begins or have that right at the initial part of, of the first period and, you know, have them walk around or they have an outside part or run and, you know, playing games in school. I had one teacher every 15 minutes, he'd, he'd have a three minute break and exercise, whether it was dance moves, he'd play the music loud, whatever, and people would get up and dance or they'd do some movement exercise every 15, 20 minutes. And everybody said, oh, this is going to take away from school. Well, no, his class was excelling. And not only that, but everybody wanted to come to school. Everybody was excited to see what it was going to be and participate because they enjoyed it. So you can add it into the classroom, you know, standing, getting up, moving, changing positions, everything is involved with the movement that really makes a difference. And you hit on the big piece of feedback that I get, or the pushback, I should say, is I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. It's, it's almost like you don't have time not to, right? Like, right. like you're going to accelerate learning here. Yeah. So I guess my last question for you is, what do you do to stay active? Like, are you still pretty good with your exercise and activity? Because it seems like you're still crushing it. Well, that's one of the great things about Hawaii is it, it's all outside. You know, I mean, every morning I get up, I'm still on East Coast time. So I get up very early and go to Starbucks, which is an, a mile away and get my coffee and come back. And that begins a day. And then I see a bunch of patients. And then I have the afternoon to play. And, you know, I have a physical trainer. I go to the gym twice a week, at least. And we have the mountain right next to us. So be walking and hiking here in Hawaii, mainly just getting after it. And we have a car here, but we never use it or try not to. So we have to walk everywhere. So, you know, and and, and we do Zumba. We have a, a Zumba group that's been going on and now for 
about five years under the banyan trees here in our central park of, of Hawaii, taught by a Japanese woman who just loves it and everybody loves her. On Saturday morning, we'll have 60 to 70 people doing Zumba. That's awesome. One of my favorite part about that story is that you have to earn your Starbucks. Like you actually have to wake up and you, you have to earn that coffee, which I think is such a great microcosm for everything that we're talking about. So, I mean, just thank you so much for all you've done for our community and thank you so much for everything. And yeah, we're huge fans of your work and, and thanks for helping Untapped. Okay, well, keep it up, keep moving and, and have fun too. Have fun, that's important, especially in our today's world. The more fun you do, the better. Awesome, thank you again. Okay, bye now.